Happy to be here. Okay. You hear me okay? It could be louder. Right. All right. So, um, you know, I started a new trend this week about trying to come up with a blockchain, jo blockchain joke before every talk that I give. And I just want to say that um, most of the time, nobody understands them. Okay. Uh, and the other thing is, there's actually so few good blockchain jokes. Okay, like, there, like, just try to come up with some blockchain blockchain jokes that actually resonate. All right, so I'm gonna give you one more shot. This could be the last blockchain joke <laughs> that I ever tell. All right, okay. So why did I think it's like the why did the crypto asset have so much trouble with its relationships? And the answer is because it could not commit to a stable coin. <laughs> All right, there, maybe. Okay, but th th this really could be the last one, though. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, I'm working. I'm working on it. All right. Okay. So, um, given that, I'm going to talk about. Um, the future of cryptocurrencies, because that's what you guys are all talking about. I want to talk about AI and regulation. I'm building on the comments um, that you were just making about AI overall. Okay, so let me do that. Um, let's start with a little background. Uh, here's my version of, of history, which I guess everyone's allowed to have their own version. But mine is, you know, in this space, mine is in 2008, there's a banking crisis. And coincidentally, in 2008, um, you know, going into 2009, there's basically the, the Bitcoin white paper. And it just seems like almost too coincidental that those are like right next to each other. Um, the like kind of collapsing of that one financial system and someone taking all these different technologies, which were developing and, and starting to be understood, but actually packaging it together and and writing it into a paper. Um, when I think of that paper, I like I uh, I kind of think of it as like an alternative gold standard. I mean, like so many of the terms are similar. Like you have miners, and the, you you increase the supply every so often, and you know, like there's a lot that's like, and you know, like does gold have an inherent value? Uh, just like, do bits have an inherent value? You know, why not? If there's a limited supply of these things, and maybe you could, you know, switch over to, to, to this other version. And, you know, if I think of it like that, I think, all right, you know, um, how practical is it that you go and shop with gold coins everywhere? Like, it's, it's a standard, it's an asset, people, you know, can use it, but there's... But, you know, we moved on beyond, like, using gold coins everywhere where we go. Um, and so, you know, in 2013, that was, like, probably one of the first, like, major variations. And we are funded by Ripple, so, like, disclaimer right there. But, um, but Ripple made basically what I think of as, like, a practical version, one that, you know, like, with Bitcoin you could just not get the volume of transactions. It takes too long for the settlement. There's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's very secure. It's got a lot of things that go in its favor, but the Ripple one had the volume that, you know, that you could, like if you wanted to do the number of Visa card transactions, you want to do something similar to that, you could not do it with the, with, with the other technology. So, you know, we had Ripple, I think of, you know, they changed the, the, um, the the validation method or the consensus method. So you got speed and scale with that one. And within one year or so, uh, you know, Ethereum was being developed. And, you know, that's one was, uh, to me, that's like the innovative version. And um, in the sense that you could have smart contracts. And it has yet a different consensus mechanism. So we've had these three come along. Um, 2017, everyone wanted to do an ICO. And then I think that's the first time that regulators actually started to pay attention to this and said, okay, well, you know, you're basically selling all this stuff to people who are consumers and no one is protecting them. And, you know, like if you go back, like that's what happened before also with just normal stocks. And so regulation started to pay attention. I think the thing that we haven't fully considered yet is what is the effect of AI 
because up till now, this has all been kind of non-AI, and AI is about to you know, affect all of these things. But what, what do we have right now? We've got a transport mechanism for money. We have an immutable database where you can write something and you can't erase it, and you have a new type of asset. And now AI is about to happen, right? So um, to me, that means, um, of course, we've got new financial applications. We have the regulatory challenges that emerged, and now there's this question of effects of AI. So let me try to introduce that with an example, all right? Um, like, I'm sure you think of examples all the time of new applications. Let me, let me give you one, all right? Can a robot become an entrepreneur? My, my not so random question here. And, um, it tr and for all those entrepreneurs before you just completely you know, discount that, <laughs> okay, and, and whatever, like, we, we can debate it, okay, but I'm, it's not that I'm for or against it, but let me at least introduce the, this idea that um, we have a professor in our group, his name is Eduardo Castillo, um, and uh, he was at MIT when he actually did this work and is continuing it on, you know, in, in my group, um, in, in my school, and um, so that project was called uh, Gakachu. It's a self-employed robot artist. And the way it works, the way it worked when, it, when, it, when they did the project, is that the, the robot makes a painting. The okay? robot makes a painting. And then the robot has an auction, and it sells the painting on the internet. And uh, people literally bid for this painting, and so they put uh, Ethereum into, you know, in, into the ledger and, and they transfer it to the robot. And so the robot, quote, made some money and then the robot uses some of that money and it buys art supplies and then with those new art supplies it can make another painting and every so often it has, it has a business, it has a, you know, it has a lifestyle or whatever, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's an entrepreneur almost, you know. Okay, so, um, and by the way, I did start the Entrepreneurship Center at Berkeley, and I ran it for like 17 years. So don't, like, I don't mean to say that that's what I think an entrepreneur like completely does. I, I understand the many layers behind that. But um, let's just say that this like surface level model is kind of entrepreneurial. For a robot, I think it's very entrepreneurial. And it actually made money. So um, here we are. Um, it, it, this is over a six-month period, and it got a you know increased bank balance. It, it made some money in the auctions. It would buy supplies. You know, basically, did it right? Okay, so great. And why am I bringing this up? Because Gakachu is an artist. Here I'm reading at the bottom. It's an artist. It does an auction. It buys supplies. It grows its business operation. Of course. It's not a legal person. And this is all before generative AI. So whatever you can think that this thing did in, in the kind of code cycle that, that it was built around, that's before you put in the finesse of AI options, before you put in the how much better it could be at customer service, that before it can start thinking of new products on its own. I mean, like, there's so many things that you know, you can do a generative AI mixed into this, which no one has really tested. Coincidentally, or interestingly enough, the, the research group that made this thing tried to incorporate it in such a way that there was no human in the incorporation. And so they couldn't actually get that to happen on, on first step. So they made it so that the only asset in the company, they had a board, and the only asset in the company was the robot. And then each of the board members basically like kind of dropped out one at a time. And, and they had the robot buy the shares of the company to the point where if, when the last person drops out, only the robot is left as the owner of this thing, to which the state of Delaware told them that they just cannot do this, and they got stuck on the regulatory issue of trying to get a robot to own itself and, and, and to run this thing. But, you know, I, why am I bringing this up? Obviously, because I want to say all, all those use cases that you're thinking of, we haven't really seen all the use cases and, you know, where this is going and what it means for regulation. AI does affect uh, where regulation will go.
if I go back to what I'll call the everyday, you know, the, the today situation, these are the, you know, most common, <coughs> you know, most common financial applications that, you know, everything from cryptocurrency and, and, and trading money and, you know, smart contract, real estate, energy trading, gaming. And different ones have different regulatory barriers. And, you know, I will say, um, you know, what is the problem with any of these? Is it the market? Is there no customer for these? No, there's, there's customers. Is it that the technology doesn't work? No, the, the technology works. Uh, you know, how far these all get into the world over this last decade have largely been uh, how comfortable the people who are doing it feel about the regulatory environment that they're in. In other words, like, does the CFO sign off? Does the chief legal officer at the company sign off and say, yeah, go ahead with that product because we feel comfortable that the regulatory framework is there to support it. And then you can, like, you probably are the banks or you know the banks or you know the environment, but, you know, my experience is when you talk to them, that's, like, the number one thing that's held them back from adoption over this period of time. So um, if you talk about, all right, what is regulation, you know, how do you regulate assets, this is the standard things that happen in, not quite in order, but in increasing complexity. So, you know, first there's defining the asset, like what is it? What, you know, what is a virtual asset? And then registering, being allowed to sell it to someone, being allowed to trade it, being allowed to be an exchange. And then you start getting to, well, do you know your customer? And making sure that they're not doing something odd with, with you know, the infrastructure that you're putting in place. And then you get to, if you know your customer, can you protect your customer from people who are trying to take advantage or, um, you know, manipulate the market and, you know, and things like that. And there's, you know, everything down to cybersecurity, like all the ways that customers need protection. And then, you know, you finally get to ensuring li liquidity because, okay, you've got the coins, but now somebody wants to get out of the coin and guess what? Nobody wants to to give them any money back or whichever. So, you know, that's kind of a real issue. And with virtual assets, because at least historically, there's not something backing it up, like physical, like there's many assets that are not, you haven't got that, like, well, worst case, you just take delivery. Like, you haven't got a thing that you can even just take delivery of, okay? And so, and then you get finally to cross border, which I think is like the most complex of all the issues, because, you know, in one country, it's perfectly legal. In another country, it's not legal. But the people who are doing these transactions are on the same technology, whether they're in this country or that country. So one person does something, and what they do to another person is illegal in that other country. But what can you do to that person? Because they don't live in this country. You can't do anything to them. The only channel that you have is to talk to your government, to talk to their government, to then see if they care at all about what that person is doing that you consider illegal in your country. It's a very slow cycle, right? And you're probably facing, or you probably understand, you know, these in a lot of like context and everyday situations and so forth. But that's the most complex. And you're getting from technology down to really politics. Like uh, that's, you know, that's like the, the spectrum that we're, we're facing. So now, um, those are all the, those are the financial ones, let alone before a robot is, uh, you know, a fully self-acting entity and all of that. There's all of these kind of more everyday non-financial use cases, health record management, voting system, supply chain, identity management, energy trading. Uh, you could maybe call that, um, well, the non-monetary version of it, intellectual property, like writing that you had this idea before someone else on the blockchain, all of those types of things, document authentication. And, and so first point is, you know, there's a lot more non-financial use cases than financial use cases. Like, and I think that's something that people never really think about because they, 
they work on the financial use cases. And then the, the thing is, regulation is still a barrier. Regulation for these doesn't apply even more than it doesn't apply in the financial use cases. Um, and like I said, this is before you get to virtual agents that are owning their own thing, acting like the robot, nobody, like, do they control, are they controlled by anything, are they controlling other things, like, you, you know, there, there's a whole other kind of where the virtual technologies are going, or the exponential ones, if you want, okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, that gives us these questions, which we are looking at with our virtual asset regulation lab with Ripple and Ubery, you know, about the non-financial use cases, the, uh, um, you know, identity is very central, um, things that I more or less have been saying up till now. And, you know, why am I bringing this up right now? I want to invite you to a small party. It's not an actual party, but I want to invite you to a, a club, maybe. Um, so what we're doing is we're, you know, we want to fix a problem in education and in research, which is that a lot of times it can be too narrow and abstract, um, kind of academic silos and disconnected from industry and ventures. So I have this black and white picture just to show you how boring that can be and not engaging. And I want to get to something that's really fun and amazing for students, okay, and for the researchers that can be in these things. And so, you know, part of our Impact Accelerator Lab um, and with this virtual asset lab, we're making a, what's called a gateway program. And like, it's a teaching and an experiential program that like lets you understand, like get into this like financial world, into the, in, into the distributed ledger, XRP, FinTech kind of world for, for students, okay? And I want those projects, I want those, um, those things that happen in there to be as real and possible. So much is happening here in Dubai and you know, like, I invite any of you, just give me your card or whatever. Um, I'd like to, like, have a part of whatever they do be connected to at least conversations with you, okay? All right, so join the community. Um, it's not my last slide, by the way. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know I could be, but no. All right. Um, so now, you know, let's talk about what's going on in research themes. Um, all right, so one thing that researchers tend to talk about these days, and I think, like, I, I got three kind of themes that I think people are, are talking about. Um, one of them is regulatory compliance and where zero knowledge proofs fit into that. Um, I don't know how many of you are following this in a lot of detail or, or just a little bit, but here's the kind of, like, play-by-play -play of it, which is, um, let's see if I can point here. Um, from a market view, people don't think that they can really make use of um, ledgers unless they can have private information. Like, you know, like they don't really it, like you don't really want your bank account to be uh, visible to every other person in the world. Like the, that's kind of the idea. And I'm not saying that it is now or there's no other solutions, but in general, the market wants to have some privacy. And the technology kind of makes it so once it's private. It's really private, like not even the government, nobody can actually see it, right? I mean, like if you try to break, oh, forget it, oh, like we'll give you examples later. All right, um, and so um, on the regulatory side, well, you need transparency. And in real life, how do you solve that? Like, like your bank account is not public, right? Or, you know, like people can't get to it. But if the government wanted to know what was in your bank account, there's a way that they could ask the bank, there's a way that they could wiretap you, there, there's a way that they can if they needed to, and maybe there's like, you have to go to a court or something to get it done, but there's a way that you can get to it. But in this system right now, there's not a way. It's either it's public or it's not public. I mean, they could like take you to court and make you give the key or something, you know, the private key, but there's really no way to just get pieces of information. And that's why um, a lot of the research community is trying to figure out if these zero knowledge proofs and ZK snark and all of this could actually solve that problem. And mathematically, it's fairly solid how this works, um, but in practice, there's a lot of things that go wrong at the edges, and, you know, and that's kind of like where we really have to figure it out. 
But um, if you want a quick primer on how this works, it's kind of like you have like your bank balance and it's encrypted in the blockchain. And you know, you're the user and you can read you know, your bank balance. And you want to prove to the government that um, you did not receive a million or 10,000 euros or Bitcoin or, you know, you, that you did not receive some large amount of money into this account. So besides giving them your key, which also gives them access to take money out and do every other thing, what you can do is, um, and there's a possibility that I'm about to like lose everybody, like right now I've only lost 50% of you, but, you know, the, I'm about to lose all the rest of you right now. Um, so what what you can do is you can take that X, even the encrypted version of it, and you can put it into a function which would give you a number called W, and W is called a witness in, in this case. And that witness and the function are sent from here to here. And the person here cannot know X, but they can know that you could not have given the value W if you did not know X. And it's impossible to go from the W back to the X. This is like part of it. And why can they just not make up any X and stick it in a function? The reason is because in this mechanism, they don't give you all, it's like if you're showing your math, they don't show you all the steps, but they prove to you that every step was actually done. So you know that this, when you put something in, that answer really is the result of those computations, even though you don't know what the computations were, because they're done in the math of an elliptical curve space or whichever. Okay, that's an offline conversation. All right, so anyway, that's what's going on there. Um, there are other clever things going on in this world, like the homo uh, morphic encryption, and of course, the, um, I think you're going to have a talk on the quantum topics and how close and far we are. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you can factor a um, uh, like if you can factor a large number into two prime numbers, okay, that just means take a big number and find the two prime numbers that you multiply together to make that large number. If you can do that, you can break all of RSA immediately, okay? We just, just nobody can do it, all right? Like in all these years, nobody can do it. But all you need is one mathematician or one quantum computing algorithm that can do it, and all encryption is immediately broken. Just like you can take the public key, do a computation on it, and get the private key immediately, directly, with no other information. That's the situation um, with RSA. And elliptical curve encryption, you can do that also, but it takes a lot more computing than with RSA, because it's not simply two prime numbers multiplied together. But, OK, so I don't think this is just about to happen, by the way. Um, and I don't know if someone figures it out, will they get the Nobel Prize or go to jail? I don't know either. But, you know, <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> okay, um, second trend that I think you got to pay attention to. Everyone talks about the problem of job erosion with AI. I think the real problem is misinformation and loss of truth. Okay, um, one thing is if somebody is doing an attack on, you know, this nice, polite person who's just doing their work, but they have AI, like cybersecurity, and they're doing an attack, it's a very hard for this one person to defend against all of the AI generated like in, incorrect emails and all the ways that you can target it and uh, target them and everything. So the only defense that you really have is to have AI also on the protection side, right? So as soon as, you know, if this person has a weapon and this person doesn't have a weapon, this person's going to get it, right? So you, you're going to have to have the same defense, like the same quality of defense. And this is going to happen, you know, like AI becomes the thing that protects us from AI. And I think this is what's happening with blockchain also. However many ways that you can get around the infrastructure with blockchain, if AI is going to be used to get into it, you're going to need AI to be protecting on, on that side. 
And if I take this trust and, and security issue further, I think you all, this is supposed to be Taylor Swift, I think you all know that um, there's a, a bunch of deep fake pictures and, and it's not like, um, they're not actually her and all that kind of thing. But um, the thing is that in US, it is not illegal to make a deep fake of someone, okay? There's, like, you can do this, and there's no law that says you did anything wrong. They call that freedom of speech in the US, just by the way, all right? So, yeah, you can make a commercial, you can do kind of like whatever you want. And so, like, um, and, and so, like, that and a number of things that have happened before have been kind of eroding what we can trust and verify. And like we're getting further and further into what you can no longer verify is true. I saw the picture, but it's not true. I, you know, like all of these things, you know, um, okay, and like this is almost like a lecture on its own, but let's just go with like, you can't tell what, it, what is true and it's getting farther and farther in that direction. So um, I'm gonna point this out, but so far we cannot fake a website. Right? You cannot like, go to like ATT.com or you know a company's website and you cannot say like if it says ATT.com and it has that little security, you know, encrypted symbol, um, the padlock, you are pretty sure that you're at ATT.com. But why are you sure? That's because there's a tr trust certificate and an infrastructure behind that that makes that possible, all right? But where did that get its information? You know, we've got to think about this, right? How does it know that this really is at and well, you know, how do they, where do they get that information to issue the trust certificate? Well, the way they do it is they call you. <laughs> they, I mean, like someone at at and asks for this thing, the trust certificate, and someone at the place which issues the trust certificate calls them and they do a video call with them and they say, so you work at at and Yes, I do. Can you show me your badge? Yeah, this is my badge on video. Okay, I, I have a pretty good sense that you represent at and and now we're gonna issue this trust certificate and all this stuff is based on that and that's why you can't fake it. Well, how long is it gonna be before you can fake that, yes, I'm working at AT&T and I want this certificate done in this certain way. There's a level somewhere in here which can break. And when that breaks, all the rest of it breaks above it. So, you know, all of these issues are, you know, like, we haven't seen it yet, but I think, you know, like, you really have to watch for, for the reliability of information. My last one, is um, power, and I, I think you're already starting to talk about, you know, people talked about blockchain and proof of work and the uh, amount of power. There's the amount of data that is copied over and over and the extra resources that it's used. I'll just give you an example on the AI side. If you type seven plus four into a spreadsheet, it takes, I mean, literally it takes like two computational cycles, but let's be liberal and say it takes 100 CPU cycles. If you type seven plus four into chat GPT, first of all, it might not even tell you it's 11, but if it tells you it's 11, it'll do it after 10 billion computations. Think about that. You're going from like two to 10 or 100 computations to 10 billion to tell you the answer to seven plus four. If you do one generated image, it takes three kilowatts of power, kilowatt hours of power to generate one image. Now imagine millions of people all generating images all the time and machines asking for images to be generated and movies being generated. Like, okay, the, um, what you're gonna see in terms of the power requirements on a combination of blockchain, crypto, and combined with AI is a exponential <laughs> curve, okay? Um, and, um, you know, already Goldman Sachs is saying um, by 2030, which is, you know, just basically like six years from now, 10% of all power consumption in the United States, you know, for, right? And driving your car is like 13%, okay? Like, it's getting 
the AI and, and virtual side of the world is getting to be more power consumption than the physical part of the world, which is what nobody ever would have imagined, right? Like, you, ne you know, oh, let's do it online because it will save the environment. Well, it's actually getting the other way around. Okay, um, I'm gonna end the talk and just say that these are the things that, you know, if it's, it's either a personal hobby of mine or it's just like, um, you know, the projects that we have, but we're basically interested in how blockchain and AI affects power, health, academics, like all the other topics. That's, that's what we're doing with our kind of think tank, virtual think tank laboratory. Um, and then I'll say thank you. Uh, thanks to um, Ubri and Ripple and Vara um, and all our affiliated collaborators, you know, from, from Berkeley and IE and just, you know, everyone involved, all right? Um, last line, I guess I could say, we're building a new type of science and technology school, one that's super industry connected, entrepreneurial all the way through, and completely international, as in you can come from anywhere and go to anywhere. Um, that's so you understand, like, what we're working on, okay? All right, well, thank you.